Thank you. The original American dream, uh, time to live, a forgotten dream. It's the original dream and the forgotten dream. I'm not sure what, do I, do I change things here or do I tell you? Do I do this? Ah. The original American dream. The phrase, the American dream, was coined by James Russell Adams in a book called The American Epoch back in the 1930s. Uh, and here's what he had to say uh, about uh, the American dream. Uh, first of all, he says that it's been corrupted or being corrupted. Uh, a new vision uh, was on the ascendancy. A new definition of progress taking over. Uh, expansion of the e economy is becoming the one and only definition of progress. Mere money making and material improvements, mere extensions of the material basis of existence. Um, goes on to say that the original American dream was more than that. Certainly it was about uh, abundance, about uh, making a good life materially, but it included another better and higher dimension. The original American dream had always been about uh, quality and spiritual values. These are his words, even though I've typed this and uh, there, you'll, you'll notice a number of typos. Please forgive me. As John DeGraff told me even before we began, power corrupts <laughs> and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So you'll see. <laughs> John and I, for years, have stolen things from each other shamelessly. <laughs> and some of the things that I'll say today, uh, and he said just a minute ago, we have stolen from each other. But, and we've forgotten uh, through the years who <laughs> came up with it. And indeed, it's not ours at all. It is something that we have followed. An American tradition, a tradition that is as old as this, older than this country that begins during the colonial period with people like Jonathan Edwards, which I'll show you. He feared in our struggle to make a living, we are forgetting to live. The original American dream, uh, this is my favorite, education was deteriorating, becoming merely utilitarian and aimless. Yes. <laughs> uh, we are, no, I asked my class, why are you here? Why are you sitting in my classroom? And inevitably, they will talk about work, not how to live, but how to work. And that we have misled generations of students who've shown up at the University of Iowa, in my estimation. Um, the American Epic again, the original American dream. Uh, he wrote the American Epic to recall his countrymen back to what he, what he knew as America's priceless heritage, to a vision of progress as real as gold or corn crops, of progress as genuine individual search and striving for the abiding, va abiding values of life, of progress as the growth of opportunities for the common man. This is a democratic vision. It's not a bourgeois or a aristocratic vision at all. It is a democratic vision. The common man to rise to full stature in the free realms of communal, spiritual, and intellectual life. And he uses this book, <clears throat> The American Epic, to detail uh, how that dream worked itself out, he started what I'm trying to finish. <laughs> and the book that I'm trying to finish now, I'm just about finished, and goodness knows I'm going to get it done before Christmas. Um, I've got about 140,000 words, and my problem is cutting out enough so that the publisher is satisfied. He says 100,000, so we'll see. Over the last two, three decades, Adam's American Dreams has been vir virtually forgotten. He, he was fearing that the dream was being eclipsed. Now it has. His fear is largely realized. The American dream has been reduced almost completely to economic terms. What I intend to do with my books, my classes, and here today is take up Adam's standard and fight following his leads and hordes of others. I will attempt to represent that traditional American dream and help reestablish it on the solid economic grounds it occupied. The solid, eco it's not pie in the sky, which I'll get to. Progress. Remember Chris Honig last night talked about um, uh, the American value of progress. Uh, progress, in, I think, <laughs> in my estimation, in my study, has to do with freedom. Liberty and progress go together. The advance of freedom, the advance of liberty is as good of a definition of progress as any. Uh, uh, Adams uh, followed this, this line of reasoning himself. 
Uh, progress understood as the advance of, of liberty, universal value, uh, American exceptionalism, perhaps. Uh, but how can you deny that freedom is a universal value held by all people? Uh, it, it seems to me that's as close to a universal truth that we can come. Who wants to be a slave? Who wants to be uh, tyrannized by other people? Who wants to be held in thrall by the people around, uh, around them? Um, it, it seems to me that if there is a universal human uh, uh, desire, it is the desire to be free. Uh, typically, in, in the United States, that I, the prog progress of freedom uh, was understood to take place in three stages. <clears throat> Stage one is the political freedom, free from the chains of oppression and intolerance. The establishment of a constitutional democracy. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, John began to talk about the Bill of Rights. Uh, Jefferson, when he writes, uh, we, all, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. He knew that what he is doing was setting a fire, that they were setting a fire, the founders, a fire of liberty that will spread. He understood that even though he used the word men, he, th this fire would spread. The fire kindled on the 4th of July, 1776, has spread over too much of the globe to be extinguished by the feeble engines of despotism and all who work them. <laughs> uh, it's going to spread. That, to me, is the history of this country, the spread of uh, uh, constitutional democracies, beginning certainly with uh, white males who own property, extending through the Jacksonian period, to people, to men that did not, white men that did not have property, through the Civil War with the, with the, the freeing of the slaves, the beginning of a long journey for Afri African Americans in this country, the women's movement uh, in, in the late uh, uh, 1900s um, that's ongoing today, but it's a continual struggle uh, to uh, progress. To, uh, uh, toward freedom, uh, gays and lesbians now, nowadays, and of course civil rights and Martin, Martin Luther King. All of that is the continuation of the story of the advance of liberty, which to me is uh, the story of this country. <clears throat> uh, why is it not moving? <laughs> PowerPoint corrupts. Am I doing something wrong here? There. Stage two, economic, free from the chains of necessity. The enlightenment uh, defined by science and reason and the application of science and reason to the economy. Technology. We will be able to invent machines that will give us enough. Abundance was understood through the 19th and much of the 20th century as the desti destination of economic progress. We will sooner or later satisfy the, the human animal, <laughs> the desire for our goods and services, it will, we will get enough. Uh, both capitalism then is the best of all possible economic systems, but it does have a, a purpose, an end, abundance, as well as work. Both of those, not booths, but both <laughs> were seen as me means to an end, uh, uh, as the road to a better freedom. Uh, they, they were uh, the servants to our humanity. The end of the economy and of economic growth is enough. What about the Protestant work ethic? Uh, wasn't that the value of the 19th and 20th century? No. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Protestant work ethic as, a, as understanding work as an end in itself and economic growth as an open-ended, eternal process, that's modern. Uh, if you go back to the old light Puritans, Cotton Mather and others, they did see human, human nature as essentially uh, um, uh, sinful. In Adam's fall, we sinned all, and there's nothing we can do about it. We are fallen creatures, period. <laughs> we are, in our fallen nature, condemned to work forever. There's no salvation. That is the, the Protestant work ethic of the hardcore Puritans. The New Light folks, people like Jonathan Edwards, uh, thought of the punishment of work, where we've sinned and we've fallen out of the garden, as a work school, that th that punishment is not permanent. Work punishment is not a permanent thing. We will learn through the discipline of work to be free. 
<laughs> Jonathan Edwards describes this. Work is a school. We will learn. We will be disciplined in our humanity. And we will grow into the possibility of being free creatures rather than uh, disciplined by, the, uh, by work. Three stages of work again. Uh, get enough. And the third, this is the third stage, higher progress. Higher progress is uh, Walt Whitman's phrase. <clears throat> but uh, it, it fits all through the 19th century. Get enough, move on beyond the courthouse, beyond the marketplace. There is this realm of freedom to realize our full potential, our full humanity, and to engage in humane and moral progress. Not, not like economic progress. Economic progress leads to the possibility of humane and moral progress. We will progress not in goods and services, but in our ability to get along with each other, <laughs> uh, to live together in families, in communities, as a nation, and with the people of the world, with people that are different from us. Think of that vision. We don't have that idea anymore, that we can progress in our, uh, our ability to, to live together. Uh, that was throughout the 19th century. That's what moral progress was. It's not about um, living a completely moral life, but it was about the possibility uh, of our living together successfully. Uh, progress, the advance of our humanity, our abilities and the skills necessary to live together, uh, um, our abilities as thinking and social creatures. Uh, unlike the realm of necessity, progress in the realm of freedom is open-ended, can be thought of as eternal. You can't think of that with uh, the lower levels. Examples um, abound in the 19th century. Uh, as I'll say later on, the, the book that I'm trying to work, I'm finishing now, is more or less a catalog of people who say these things <laughs> again and again and again and again. Uh, my problem is repetition, and I fight that, but, um, but there, there is enough variety. There is a, 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 and I'll show you the variety in a second. This is uh, 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 John, um, John Adams, a letter to his wife, Abigail. You're probably familiar with it. You see the progress. Uh, political, uh, first, going on to economic progress, ending with this realm of freedom. Uh, and you, you, you see also a gender change from sons to sons to children. Um, I think that's deliberate on his part, maybe not, but I think so. Uh, painting, poetry, that same idea of moral progress is repeated. But what the realm of freedom consists of, the actual activities that people are doing are varied. This is John, uh, this is John Adams' list, poetry, painting, music, and so forth. Henry Adams, I've got three Adams here, John Quincy, uh, Henry, um, Henry Adams, John Adams, and uh, James Adams. Uh, this is his wonderful history of, uh, of, uh, of the United States during uh, Thomas Jefferson's administration. It, it's, he, he, right, he sees the vision. Uh, he talks about um, uh, a nobler culture might rise to the level of that democratic genius which founded the Parthenon. He, he's looking back to the Greek uh, uh, golden age and seeing the possibility of a democratic realization of that Greek golden age not based on human slaves but based on machine slaves. Technology will free the common man and woman to live a life comparable to that uh, of, of the aristocrat during the uh, golden age that was Greece. Might for 500 million people, <laughs> the America of thought and art, which alone could satisfy the omnivorous uh, ambition. Uh, also, James Thurston Adams, the three Adamses. Uh, my favorite of all <laughs> is Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman is a lovely man, and I've grown to love the, the guy. He says the same thing. His phrase is higher progress. Progress in three stages. Uh, uh, these are quotes from Democratic Vistas. You start out with political progress uh, for all people, progressing along. Uh, you, 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 you go to economic progress uh, and the possibility of succeeding. You see this, he says, we'll be, we'll be successful. Um, uh, and leading on, this is again to Democratic Vistas, leading on to, uh, th this is abundance enough, sorry. Uh, third stage, the soul of man. Uh, he 
rewrites the whole of democratic justice for this purpose <laughs> uh, to, uh, to show out of such considerations, such truths arising, arises for them, uh, for treatment of, uh, in these vistas. He's, he's so, sometimes hard to understand, but he writes democratic vistas comparing himself to uh, a person standing on a height on the two first levels, the two first platforms of political progress, economic progress. I'm standing on those two levels and I'm looking forward into this realm of freedom. Democratic vista, that's what I see. I see in the future the possibility of this freedom and he d devotes uh, uh, democratic vistas to uh, uh, talking about uh, the soul of man. John talked about depression. Uh, if the soul is not nourished, if we don't give it time, uh, it, it will begin to starve. And the symptoms of a starving soul is a secret, silent, loathing, and despair. Depression. <laughs> uh, if we starve our soul, don't give it time, attention, build skills necessary to sustain it, uh, we invite uh, catastrophe. And, and uh, Walt Whitman is warning us about this in the 1870s uh, with democratic vistas. Time to live a forgotten American dream, a catalog. This, this is a list of a few people <laughs> that have that the view. Edward, uh, Jonathan Edwards, Channing, Bushnell, Bishop Spaulding, um, uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, John Ryan, and so forth. Um, Fanny of Cohen, uh, I hope I have time to talk about her. Uh, but moving on here. Agrarian, hayseed, unrealistic. This is the charge uh, that's made typically of people like Whitman and this old-fashioned view. It's not realistic today. We have uh, 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 economic necessity that overrides any considerations, uh, any possibility. This is what puts the 19th century dream of higher progress on the ground. John mentioned this before, short hours. Short hours. Beginning in 1800 through 1920, progressive shortening, shortening of the hours of labor, uh, a shortening of hours of labor, cutting them virtually in half. The expectation of the 19th and 20th century was that the process would continue. No one predicted that this would stop. I usually start my lecture with this. <laughs> um, no one predicted that this process would stop and that by year, the year 2000 or 2010, we would be down as uh, John Maynard Keynes, the fam most famous economist of the 20th century, said uh, in 1930, the future economic possibilities of our grandchildren by 1980 would be working two hours a day. No one thought that this would happen. Everyone who considered this <laughs> uh, uh, believed that this was inevitable and that the, the, the possibility and the challenge of higher progress would be the central reality of the 20th century. I have not, and I've done this for 35 years, I have not found anyone who predicted what, what did happen to, to, to in advance, that is the stabilizing of working hours and the recent advancing, which I'll get to if I have time. <clears throat> but it's not a bourgeois vision. <laughs> Originally, this division of higher progress, even though you have these wonderful spokespersons like Jonathan Edwards, was a working class vision. It comes from the working class, the labor movement. The labor movement fights uh, on their own for shorter hours, and they are animated by this vision of higher progress. They fight for 10 hours, for example, relief from, for, uh, from, from toil, yes, but they also have a vision of the future. Uh, one of the earliest documents of American history and labor history uh, um, talks about 10 to 8 to 6 to 4, the reduction of the workday, and so forth. That was at the heart of the American labor movement for over a hundred years. <laughs> the progressive shortening of the hours of labor uh, was the vision. Uh, the 10-hour system was the alternative to the selfish system, the selfish system that teaches us selfishness, uh, competition, and so forth, uh, was uh, seen to be a, a vehicle that leads beyond to higher progress and the possibility of a selfless existence where people care for each other rather than only care for themselves. Uh, this is an example of the unnamed Lowell woman, uh, a, 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 girl, a mill girl, <laughs> who writes for the Voice of Industry in uh, 1847. There it is. Um, it is not because they are shut up in a factory that they are happy, 
but because they are blessed with a happy and hopeful vision which can pierce through the thick walls and look beyond to that coveted but slow-moving hour that shall place them beyond the influence of factory bolts and locks and a factory of oppression. <clears throat> In the label movement, you find a critique of the selfish system, uh, 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 laissez-faire capitalism. Not, to the, not, not a critique that, that looks to overthrow the laissez-faire system, but to escape it. There's a difference. The socialist, the communist uh, solution to the selfish system, laissez-faire capitalism, is to, to replace the government. The working, the working, the labor movement in the, in the United States, uh, typically, <laughs> Uh, for the most part, uh, concentrated on a constitutional democracy and the way to short hours is the way to free short, within the capitalist, within the uh, let's say, um, constitutional democracy, the way to liberation was through short hours. Um, work in the capitalist system, but it was about competition control, class or uh, inequality, success, getting ahead, and a cultivated and refined distended sense of property ownership of real wealth and proprietary uh, access to intangibles and keeping others off. Uh, critique of the sh uh, selfish system again is continued. Uh, thus by the nature of capitalism, this is from the labor movement, work will be, and this is a historical sequence, this is how workers in the labor movement tended to talk about work through time. Tended uh, is a tyrannical, um, beginning the 10 hour movement compared to Great Britain, uh, and its tyranny over the colonies, uh, the, the workers fighting for 10 hours talked about the same sort of tyrannical control they felt at work. Slave-like, before the Civil War, alienated, diskilled, devitalized, mechanical, robots, boring, dehum dehumanized, <laughs> hectic, hectic. Talk, speaking of hell, hectic, I'm fighting against time and I hate to do that. Exhausting and all-consuming, no community, not even bathroom breaks. We have this, this vision of work and its perfection. The reality of work is something else indeed. Uh, Mark Linda is not here, my colleague from um, the uh, School of Law. Uh, he's written two books about uh, the modern workplace, and this is typical. Um, as you see, <laughs> there, he, Mark Linda thought it would be a good thing to have a regulation, government policy that allow workers to go to the bathroom. Um, he lost the, fight, the battle. <laughs> uh, also, Dilbert, if, if work would be a great place if it were not for bosses. <clears throat> and this is Dilbert's boss that, that I found amusing. Uh, the typical experience of work, again, is alienating and not something that uh, oh, we would um, think of as a freeing experience. Workers' vision, opening up the realm of freedom, human progress, and progress is getting along with people uh, around. Um, John mentioned the uh, uh, um, bread and roses quote, the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. Uh, at the head of this, one of the things that is impressive to me is the uh, prominence of women in this movement, which I hope I have time to get to. Solidarity, deep community, civic engagement, all of those things were part and parcel of the American labor movement. Uh, the democratic culture, the participation of workers in their own culture, their own making their own music, doing their own drama. Pins and Needles is a play on Broadway that was very successful, but it comes out of the union, the International, uh, International labor, uh, Ladies Garment Workers Union. Uh, they put it on, it was a, sort of a, a, a community drama uh, and so forth. Workers' education, uh, ver very much a powerful movement in, uh, uh, in the unions. People like Fannie O'Conn uh, are, are leading the, uh, workers' education with this vision that we'll be able to uh, uh, accommodate workers so that they build their own culture, they do their own music, they do their own intellectual types, uh, the, the life of the mind shared in community, uh, not dependent on uh, colleges and so forth a liberation within the, the community. The shorter hour alternative to the selfish system uh, throughout the 19th and 20th century, labor's cause and successes continue to excite a multitude of visions about what might be outcomes of humane and moral progress. 
uh, and I don't have that much time to go deeply with, uh, into any of these, but the kingdom of God is certainly part of it, the idea that, um, uh, that people will have the time and the opportunity to exercise their spiritual uh, part, of their part of their being and to realize a kingdom of God where everyone is equal uh, and everyone has uh, uh, shares in the community, caring, conviviality, Love, charity, <laughs> those virtues could be uh, uh, expressed and um, practiced. Republican virtue as well, don't be confused by this. Those historians among us will know what this means. Republican virtue um, coming out of the colonial period into the revolutionary period, uh, those virtues of community uh, migrate uh, ever more to short hours and, uh, and leisure. The Aristotelian Epicurean, Neoplatonist virtues through Robert Maynard Hutchins and others, virtues of conviviality, the life of the mind in community, selflessness, simplicity, sharing, freedom, tranquility, self-sufficiency, su all attached to short hours. Uh, the German idealism also, Fichte, uh, uh, Hegel, um, through Whitman and others, attach in the United States to this process of shorter hours. Jewish sh Sabbath movement, uh, we have Saturdays, Saturdays off partly because uh, the uh, Jewish communities in the United States supported it. And some of the promise, prom uh, prominent Jewish spokespersons talked about <laughs> the Sabbath as being the model for the progressive shortening of the hours of, of labor. Things like spiritual matters, ritual, family, community, tr tradition, memory, ethnic identity, all of those things are possible in this new opening of, 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 of the realm of freedom that was uh, just about to occur. Industrial fe feminism as well, and I'm running out of time. Uh, this is one of my favorite, um, some of the most prominent of spokespersons for higher progress in the labor movement were women. Uh, uh, a dissertation at the University of Chicago, 1915, Mildred Moore, she coins the phrase industrial feminism in which she means just what I've said that uh, the, 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 the woman's vir virtues, I can't do it in one minute, Woman, woman's, uh, vir uh, women's virtues of caring, uh, uh, of community, all of those things can be um, uh, part of the, uh, um, <laughs> I'm out of time, so I, um, alternative visions attached to short hours, again, the, these are, are new possibilities, They're running quickly through them, the quotidian, uh, Love's body, democratic culture, the, democ the theater would be a part of the, the community theaters, uh, music, Randall Taunt Suzuki, <laughs> uh, cooking, Julia Child, infrastructures built uh, in, through the 19th and 20th, 20th century to support uh, the, the, this growing leisure. The park, Central Park in, in particular, is an excellent example of, of the infrastructures growing to support this coming freedom. Uh, leisure services, my profession, uh, we are uh, among the few who try to actually make, make this dream a possibility, uh, uh, offering leisure services uh, and encouraging community uh, involvement. Uh, my softball leagues, I vi visit um, my interns and uh, people who are out playing softball, <laughs> and that to me is the embodiment of this community ideal that once was at the center. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, he builds his houses with this dream in mind. Believe it or not, he does. Leisure is the center of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, ideas. Hutchins in Chicago, <laughs> I'm out of time. Uh, Hutchins in Chicago, um, uh, he's famous president of the University of Chicago, has this vision and he puts it on the ground for a while. Very controversial, two years and out, you get a BA degree in two years, he wants the whole of the University of Chicago to be an adult education, facilitating community education and community uh, uh, involvement with the great books of the Western world also as part of this. Um, what happened <laughs> uh, in short hours didn't occur, um, and I'll stop here. The old vision has been eclipsed by the new vision, uh, the, the new mythology, uh, the new utopias.